Five years in Iraq, seven years in Afghanistan. These wars have placed a great strain on the U.S. military. So much so that some argue that American armed forces have reached their breaking point. Do U.S. troops have what they need to fight these wars? And what if a new conflict arose? Would the military be able to respond with the swiftness and coordination to which the world has become accustomed? We'll look at these and other issues next on Great Decisions. In a democracy, agreement is not essential, but participation is. Join us as we discuss today's most critical global issues. Join us for Great Decisions. Great Decisions is produced by the Foreign Policy Association, inspiring Americans to learn more about the world. Funding for Great Decisions is provided by the Star Foundation and U.S. Trust. A year ago, the Army's Vice Chief of Staff dropped a bombshell. General Richard Cody told Congress the Army had neither the time nor the resources to prepare for or conduct other missions it could potentially face around the world. And this is hardly the first time in recent memory the Army's overall capabilities and readiness have been called into question. From the early days of Iraq and Afghanistan, when we read reports of soldiers buying their own body armor, to the proliferation of the improvised explosive device, and the need for more up-armored Humvees, and later the stories of extended tours of duty. To many, it looks like the U.S. military has been playing catch-up. The military says this because the armed forces are facing a new kind of conflict with a new kind of enemy, and therefore have to adapt. It takes time. But how will that learning curve and the additional forces and resources it requires affect the military in the future? The bottom line is, today, if there's a tsunami that hits the United States, if there's another war in a place like Korea, we will be in a position of enormous strategic peril because we have under-resourced and damaged our fighting capability. Of primary concern to the top brass is making sure troop levels hold. Military recruiters are doing everything they can to meet recruiting goals. They've raised the maximum age from 35 to 42. They accept more recruits who score at the bottom of the armed forces qualification test. And they're taking more soldiers with criminal records and what the Army calls moral turpitude. And consider this, Navy SEAL spots are only 86% filled. Yet last year, those who passed the physical exam for entrance into the elite squad jumped from 34 to 77 percent. At the same time, more recent graduates of the Army's West Point are leaving the armed services than before. Nobody wants to use the word draft. But the truth is that nobody knows if you can expand the volunteer army in wartime conditions. Iraq and Afghanistan have shown us that the responsibilities of modern armed forces encompass more than just fighting and winning battles. U.S. soldiers must now be builders, policemen and women, town administrators, social workers. Is today's U.S. military prepared to take on those responsibilities? Do American troops have the equipment and training they need? Are there enough troops? The next president of the United States will have to address these and other problems, including paying for all of this. The annual budget for the Department of Defense is nearing half a trillion dollars, and that does not include the costs of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, which now stand at more than $378 billion. Everyone admits that's a lot of money, and it doesn't even include the cost of casualties on the ground in Iraq and Afghanistan. Waning War Machine, the State of the U.S. Military, next on Great Decisions. And now from our New York studios, here is Ralph Beglinder. Welcome to Great Decisions. Joining us now to discuss the stresses and strains on the U.S. military around the world are Larry Korb, Senior Fellow at the Center for American Progress in Washington, and Thomas Donnelly, Resident Fellow at the American Enterprise Institute in Washington. Welcome to you both. 